everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me again. In this week's lesson, we're going to go through a lead study in a kind of Motown, soul and stack style. We're going to be incorporating a lot of really lovely sounding melodic phrases, often constructed out of double stops, triads or the chords themselves. And along the way, we're going to be throwing in a lot of the common tricks that players like Steve Cropper, Cornell Dupree, Curtis Mayfield and even Jimi Hendrix would use. We might even throw in a touch of Ernest Wrangling in there somewhere. As with the Chicago Blues lesson, in this one I'm not using my own backing track, but one that I downloaded from the Cinelli Brothers backing track store. This is from their Lonesome In Your Bedroom Volume 3 backing track collection, and they've titled it Soul Bouquet, and it's like a Motown vibe in the key of D. I'd highly recommend checking out their backing tracks, they have a lot of them up there, very affordable, and they're super authentic, vintage, and legit sounding. Definitely my favourite backing tracks I've found so far. So, first of all, let's rattle through these changes. We're in the key of D, starting on the 1. Then the 6, relative minor, B minor. Down to the 4, G. Up to the 5, the A. Back to the 1. 6, Four, then to the five, back to the one. Then into the bridge, we go to the five, the A. Back to the one. Up to the two major. Five. Back to the original progression one more time. D, B minor, to the 4, 5, 1. If you want to get hold of my very thorough lesson materials for this, do check out the links in the description. I have a Patreon where you can get access to all of my lesson materials, past, present and future, plus a ton of bonus stuff and transcriptions, all for the low price of just £10. Click that link and come and join us. Our community is constantly expanding, we have over 150 like-minded guitar players there now with a real passion for learning. If Patreon isn't your thing, you can make a one-off purchase for this lesson in particular at the Gumroad link. Or if you'd just like to show your support, feel free to buy me a coffee at the link in the description too. However you choose to show your support for my channel and the work that I do here, I really do appreciate it, so thank you so much. Okay, now on to the lead part. Here's our first phrase. Three, four, one. Now these are some of the most useful phrases you could ever learn on the guitar. Don't think of them as Motown and soul only. They're really useful in country, jazz and blues and everything else. Pop music especially, in fact. I'm thinking about D major triads. As a side note, I do recommend practicing your triads in grids like that. So we take the top two notes of our triad and slide them up and back a whole tone. And then we're visualizing what would be on the G and B strings within that shape and hammering on to the G string note from a whole tone below. So again, we're ending back up in the triad shape. That's a great phrase. Very Hendrixy as well, of course. Now for the next part of the phrase, we're heading down to this triad here on the 7th fret of the G and B strings. We're going to play that double stop and hammer on to 9 on the G. All of these double stops, by the way, it's important that everything rings true. Don't block the string underneath as you're hammering on. And then we come back off, back to that double 7 on the G and B again. And then we grab the 9th fret of the D string, and then we lift everything one string closer to the ceiling barring the 7th fret of the D and G this time, hammering on on the D string to the 9th fret. And again, be careful not to block the G underneath. And then we're bringing that whole pattern with us. We go to the 9th fret of the A string. All of these things should be played with a fairly hefty downstroke. You want to almost pop the strings. 
no strumming. It's more of a pop. And what I mean by that is you want to get the plectrum behind the string and pop through it with some force. That's a huge part of this Motown sort of sound, that tone, that percussive pop on the front end of the note. And then we're playing another double stop, barring the seventh fret of the A and D strings this time, hammering onto nine on the A. So we're just dragging everything with us through the string sets. By the time we've done all that, we've outlined an entire D major pentatonic scale. Which of course is the same thing as B minor pentatonic scale. So here's the phrase. And then we're right on top of the chord change here. So we're thinking what's coming next. We've got a B minor landing on the next beat. So we're going to grab anything we can that relates. We go for the obvious choice to begin with. Just the root note, the B, on the seventh fret of the low E string. Even that alone is enough to imply that we've gone from our 1 to our 6th chord. On the B minor now we've got our root already, then we're going to grab the top three strings at the 7th fret, so a simple B minor triad, and then we're going to play this phrase here, sliding from 9 to 11 on the G string, and then grabbing the 10th fret of the top E. So this would be part of your B minor triad, second inversion. So we're kind of visualizing and utilizing these two portions of your D minor triads. And then we're going to do something a little fancy. We're going to grab a B minor 7 on the top four strings. This is one of those shapes I've spoken a lot about, about getting used to barring that second finger from the final knuckle joint. It's a good technique to, to practice, that bending in of the finger. And then we hammer on from that top string 10th fret to the 12th fret with the little finger and we do it twice. So that's a B minor 11. It's kind of like we're doing B minor 7 to B minor 11. Now remember that B minor 11 thing because we're going to revisit that further on in the piece as well. The minor 11 is such a great sound to bring in over a minor chord. Now again we're on top of the next chord change. We're going to go to the G next. So we're going to grab a G major spread triad. Frets 9 on the D, 8 on the B, 10 on the top E. Give it one good hit and slide away. Gives us a nice bit of structure that breaks things up nicely. So do remember that you can get the lesson materials for this at the links in the description. That has all the tab and notation that you need on here to know exactly which note I'm playing and where. Now on the G we're going to play a phrase very similar to our opening phrase on the D chord. Now again we want to be thinking about triads here, in this case a G major triad. So again we could block it out like we did earlier, across the four string sets in that particular position. So we're starting within kind of like the A shape of the cage system if you want to see it that way. And then ending up in the G shape of the cage system. And along the way we just add in these little hammer-ons. Again, making sure to keep all these double stops nice and alive sounding. Don't block anything out. Okay, so let's just take a quick tangent here for a moment, just to bring some pieces of information together. If we move all that G stuff down to the 5th fret, we're back on the D. Now, do you remember the first phrase? We started on D up here, but then we ended up in the same place here. in the sort of G shape for the D chord, if we're thinking caged system. So notice how we can start on either side of that G shape and end up in the middle there. So you want to practice descending from your E shape of the caged system to the G shape, or ascending from the A shape and ending up in that G shape. It's good to have everything just planned out that way. It means you're never going to get lost.
Okay, back to our piece. We've ended up here. Now there's another chord landing on the next beat, the A chord, our five. So we're going to grab the root. So there's A, 12th fret of the A string. Now this is where we need to understand a bit about chord function in order to be able to truly unlock some interesting sounds on these chords. Uh, the rhythm player would just be playing a basic A here, but we know that it's functioning as five because we're in the key of D. In that case, we know that if we were to extend it, it would become an A dominant seventh, or A7 for short. So it would have the root, the third, the fifth, and the flat seven in it. Now the five chord is, is arguably the most important chord in the key along with the one, because it's what creates all that tension that then resolves back to one. A lot of that tension comes courtesy of that flat and seventh. So the rhythm player might not be playing it, but we certainly will as lead players. So the phrase I'm playing here is basically just a descending A7 arpeggio within a C shape if we're thinking of the cage system again. It's important to have your arpeggios mapped out across the whole fretboard. Now to fancy this up a tiny bit, I'm putting in some chromaticism on the top line here between the fifth and the third. And we're going to do it with a couple of pull-offs and a slide. And then continue down the arpeggio. Do a little hammer and a pull from the five to the flat seven and back. And then continue down your arpeggio. There's your root. We're going to go chromatically to the flat seven. So again, putting in a passing note between two of our arpeggio notes. And then back to the third, back to the flat seven, slide down to the ninth fret of the A string. So if we think about that note we're ending on, that's landing right on beat one of the return to the D chord. And we've clocked that the major third of that chord is there, and we've forced our phrase to resolve onto it. A7, D. It's always good if you can get these little connections happening between the flat seven on the five and the three of the one. They're a semitone apart. Now we're on the one chord again, we're going to use some D major pentatonic double stops. Major pentatonic double stops are such a beautiful sound, and they're a huge part of this retro soul and Motown vibe. I mean, check it out. Gorgeous stuff, explore that as much as you can. Now we're on to the B minor again. We're going to slide into a B minor triad. And then we're going to go back and revisit that idea from earlier, B minor 11. So visualize this chord, B minor 11. Here's your minor seven three note voicing. And we're just chucking the fifth fret of the B string on top. I'm just going to isolate that top three strings of the shape and come down it. Now we're heading on to the four chord, that's our G. We're gonna play this kind of country sounding lick. Very pedal steely. And again, we can be using triads as our way of visualizing this stuff and mapping out the fretboard. Imagine a G major triad, root position on string set two, and simply take the lower two notes of that and start a semitone below, slide in, Grab the next two notes of the triad. I talk about this in a few of my videos. This is what I call sidestepping, where you just got a triad and you come in from below, very much like the whole gypsy thing of note enclosure. We'll be using more of that in a little bit as well. So, so far we have this. And notice how I'm hybrid picking here as well. Plectrum on the D string, second finger on the G string. And I move that same combination down a string. And then we're bringing in something from outside of the triad. We've got the sixth at the fifth fret of the B string, along with our fifth at the seventh fret of the G string. And then onto the 
the next part of a G major triad, again with the sixth added, we've got the root and the sixth here, and then your top two notes of your G major triad. So that's eight and seven on the B and E. You could also be seeing this as an E minor triad, which if you think about it, that would be the sixth triad in the key of G. So using that E minor triad on top of a G chord, it's gonna give you the sound of a G6 chord. part of a G major triad, the top two notes of your root position triad here. And then we're on to this portion, which again is just using that triad we started with, but one octave higher, and adding the sixth on top, courtesy of that E note at the 12th fret. These are very much like those stretch voicings that Johnny Smith would use so beautifully. So we've got the root, the third, the fifth, and the sixth. That's working over the top of the A chord as well, by the way. You could do that on the G or the A. Where we're at here, it's overlapping onto the A chord. If we think about those notes as a collection of intervals against an A root, you've now got the flat seven, the nine, the 11, and the fifth. Works pretty well over the A or the G. Now we're on our A7 chord, we're gonna play this next very much like the stuff we just discussed about the G chord. Just to explain, imagine we're looking for an A6 to begin with. Let's take an A major triad here, replace the fifth with the sixth, and look what you get, F sharp minor triad. So we can play any F sharp minor triad as a voicing for A6. Now this is why it's so important to really know your basic triads, because you're not always going to be using them at face value. You know, you've got to be able to grab an F-sharp minor triad and use it over the top of an A major chord to give you that extended sound of an A6 that you're after. Now a cool trick that's really common in country music is to take that sixth and move it down a whole tone. You can even do it chromatically like I did there, or you can just skip the middle point. And now you've got a voicing for an A9. So this is like the 9, the 5th, and the flat 7. So really it's almost like you're going from A6 to A7. So you can do that all over the fretboard, of course. Grab an F-sharp minor triad somewhere, walk it down a whole tone, and you're bringing in the sound of an A9, an A dominant 7th with the 9. Wherever you can find an F-sharp minor triad, you can do that. So we're grabbing that all the way up here, and then resolving it to D, courtesy of this D major triad on string set one. And then we grab an A major triad here on string set two, and hammer on to make it a D major triad. Now just before the bridge kicks in, we play this one last little phrase on the D chord. Again, just triad based stuff. So we're thinking of this D major triad here, just sliding in from the minor to the major third, blues style. So for a B section here, we're on an A chord, and again, remember we said that that would be the five chord of the key, so we can interpret that as an A dominant seventh and really bring out some bluesy flavor on it. We're gonna play this. We're starting with that bluesy slide from the minor to major third on the D string, and then grabbing two notes from an A9 chord, the flat seven and the nine, and then we're gonna walk through a D major scale in double stops, which we could be thinking of as A mixolydian or just D major, it doesn't really matter too much. Here we're ending up on notes from an A7 chord again, the fifth and the flat seven, and then again, if you're thinking D major there, that would be your root and your third. So our run would be, and then we're going to come down to this A major part here. But we're going to hammer on again from the minor to the major third to give it that very typical blues flavor. And then we come down an A7 arpeggio, root, flat, seven, and fifth. And then we're going to land on a D chord on the next beat. So we slide up and land on the major third of that D chord. Just like we spoke about earlier, from above, or from below, you want to be trying to resolve 
that A7 to the D major. And then we do some more of that triad based double stop side stepping thing we spoke about earlier. So let's imagine our D major triad broken down into double stops across the fretboard. Now we throw in a couple of little side steps, one at the start and one here. Makes it sound extra smooth. And then with seeing the E major coming up on the horizon, so we resolve up to it by taking this part of a D major triad and simply moving it up a whole tone so it becomes part of an E major triad. Notice again that I'm hybrid picking all those double stops. You don't have to, but it's a good thing to practice. Plectrum and fingers. Again, just to speak about function for a moment, we're thinking of this E chord as if it's a secondary dominant. So this would be the five of five. So really we're thinking E7 at this point. That's gonna resolve us to the A7 in a moment. So while we're thinking E7, we can be adding all those cool things like flat sevens and nines and thirteens. And we do this, we play a ninth with a bit of sidestepping. So an E9 on the top three strings, this is one of the many voicings for it. Frets 11, 9, and 10 from the G string down. Slide in from a semitone below. Again, there's that side stepping. And then we're taking that trick we spoke about earlier, using the, the minor triad off the sixth interval to give us the sound of a sixth, or in this case, a thirteenth. So this is a C sharp minor triad. And again, we're going to side step into it. Sounds great over the E7, right? E9 to E13. Now we take this C-sharp minor triad that we're on and we bring that top note down an octave, moving the whole thing to that next string set. And then that trick we mentioned earlier, taking that down a whole tone to make it sound like a dominant ninth. So you've got E9, E13, E13 again, E9. As a quick side note, remember that on a dominant chord, if we add the 6th, we should call it a 13 instead. So these things could be E6 or E13. They have the ability to be both. Now the A chord comes along. Again, we're thinking A7 in the back of our minds. We're going to start with a simple A major triad. And then sharpen the 5th, making it an A augmented, which is always a welcome addition on top of any dominant chord. You know, sharpening the 5th, whether that's part of the dominant chord, or as a standalone augmented voicing works very well. Name that song in the comments. So we go from major to augmented and then we throw in a little bit of Django. I can't resist, you know, he's got to be in there somewhere. This is nice, it's like an A9, but with a sharpened fifth. Resolving onto the D chord at the sixth interval. It's quite a classy way to resolve onto your chord. You don't always have to be aiming for the root, the third or the fifth. You can resolve onto something like a sixth if you want it to sound a little more ambiguous. Now for our final section of the solo, we're on the D chord to begin with. And we're going to do some Ernest Wranglin flavoured stuff. Again, not necessarily Motown and soul, but more of a reggae player. But he had a lot of jazz and soul infusions in his playing. A very classy player that you've got to check out if you've not heard him. He's got a great album from the 60s called A Mod, A Mod. And he covers a Beatles song on there, You Won't See Me. And it's a really cool version, a really good take on it, with a lot of these kinds of tricks thrown in. So one of the things I noticed that he did a lot is a lot of palm muting, a lot of major pentatonic, and a lot of double stops within that. So that's a bit of D major pentatonic, then some D major scale double stops. Again, landing on the root of the next chord, that B minor. Then we get a bit fancy. Again, this is kind of an Ernest Wranglin flavored thing. He used to throw in these sudden injections of jazzy speed. So we're thinking B minor and playing this B minor seven or B minor 11 type of sound. 
I visualize this like a, a D major seventh chord, but really if we're playing that over a B minor, you've got some really interesting intervals. You've got the flat seven and the nine in there, as well as the flat three and the five. We also add in the 11 at the 12th fret of the top string. Bit of chromaticism. Come down a B minor seven arpeggio, again with the chromatic passing note in before the flat seven. palm muting along the way. Now we're back on G, we're going to use that spread triad we had earlier. Doesn't sound quite as effective without that um, tremolo arm on the Jazz Master, which I sorely missed by the way. And then we're on the 5 chord, the A7, we're going to play some jazzy stuff. A7 with a flat 9 and a 13, so we call this A13 flat 9. And then resolve to a D6-9, or the top 4 strings of a D6-9. Then we play this rather splendid chord run, which is all part of a Barry Harris scale. I did a video going into depth on these things. The sixth diminished scale, in this case the D6 diminished scale. Go check out that video if you want to learn more. I'll link to it in the description. And then we finish off with this little phrase, which is all again surrounding a D major triad. This is a nice little trick that I use a lot. Sus4, resolving it down to the major third. So that would be a D major triad in first inversion. Replace the three with the four, and then bring it back in. Sounds really pretty if you can get everything ringing together still. Okay, so for a bit of tone talk, obviously in the opening performance I was using my Fender Jazzmaster. That was one of those American Original series, I think it was the 60s one. It was a really good guitar and I kind of miss it. Um, it had Mojo pickups in there that I'd put in, had a stay trem on it, so it was really kitted out with all the best stuff. The trem felt beautiful, to be fair. I got rid of that guitar in the end simply because I wasn't really playing it much, and at some point I'd rather pick up a vintage Jaguar or Jazzmaster. Um, although I know they're getting more and more expensive. So obviously I haven't been using that guitar for teaching this piece. I've been using my trusty 52 Tele with the Sun Bear prototype pickups in. And I'm running through my Lazy J20 amp. The reverb and tremor both coming from the Strymon Flint. Uh, it's a great sounding pedal. And I've, today I've been using the middle pickup position the whole time. Nice and sparkly. Oh, and I'm also running into the Greer light speed, but with the gain set very low. It's really just kind of adding a small touch of compression more than anything. Not much grit, really. If I dig in hard, you'll get a bit of dirt. But generally, still pretty clean. And it's really just more emulating that feel of the amp if I've got it turned up loud. So for recommended listening, I'm going to be pretty lazy and just recommend that you listen to Steve Cropper, especially his work with Booker T and the MGs, as well as Cornell Dupree, uh, Curtis Mayfield, Jimi Hendrix of course, and Ernest Wranglin. That album I mentioned earlier would be a good place to start with him. If you've enjoyed this video, please do like, subscribe and comment down below. Also hit the notification bell so you know exactly when my new videos are coming out. All of that stuff helps my channel to grow and I appreciate it massively, so thank you. So leave a comment down below with your thoughts, let me know how you're getting on with these things, um, and I'll see you next week guys for another lesson. Alright, take care.